question yeah. uh, just based on oh, yeah. you're saying that you're using nut milks. Do you generally avoid something that has carrageenan in it? I mean, carrageenan is pretty much in Carrageenan is the bad guy. I mean, there's a researcher in uh, Northwestern that has been looking at carrageenan, and it causes inflammation in the gut. Uh, and in mice studies, uh, causes IBS, even like inflammation, like you would see in inflammatory bowel disease. Um, but I think the food industry got wind of that uh, because you saw the, the carrageenan has been removed from a lot of these nut milks, and now they use sunflower lecithin instead. So you don't see the carrageenan, but you really have to be careful because I'm always the curious person. Like if you see somebody like reading labels in Whole Foods, uh, that would be me. Because <laughs> you never know where carrageenan is, and I'm always surprised. You know, any any sort of dairy-like product or something that's trying to imitate dairy might have carrageenan because it's a it's a food thickener, so it makes things it, it gives them that milky substance without you know being actual dairy. So oh, yeah. And one thing I'll say is it's actually very easy to make your own nut milks. So for example, when I'm making a smoothie, I'll put in just uh, three or four tablespoons of hemp seeds and water and you know buzz that first, and that will essentially make hemp milk. If you want it a little sweeter, you could add a date. Um, uh, or with to make a really good almond butter, just use almond, excuse me, almond milk, just use almond butter and water and put that through the blender for a minute or two, and you have like the most delicious creamy almond milk. So, and also organic does not mean that it doesn't have carrageenan in it, right? Those are separate things. So. Read the label. Yeah, you always want to read the ingredient list. And, you know, like you were saying, they started removing carrageenan. With food brands, they, they're changing the ingredients all the time. So, you know, for the most part, if you, you're, you know, eating something that's clean, it's probably fine. But you do want to check your labels every once in a while and just make sure there's not some new interesting ingredients in there. Yes? Uh, I have a question. So I have a smoothie every morning. And I was just thinking about switching it up. I, I tend to use like almond milk or like nut-based milks, but I was thinking about like, incorporating more vegetables and things like that into my breakfast. Are there any other juices you might recommend that might go better with putting vegetables in it than almond milk? Like tomato juice or something? Like that. Well, you could also try, like, there's this whole trend of cauliflower smoothies. Have you heard of this? I know it sounds really gross. It's, yeah, it's like really big on the West Coast. But if you can take, uh, you could either take cauliflower yourself, steam it, and then freeze it, or which is much, what is much easier is to just buy the riced cauliflower, which you can get, you know, in the freezer section at the store. And then, you know, you could add things like almond butter. Um, you could put berries in there, and then it, it's, it doesn't really taste like anything. It just adds creaminess and bulk. So you can pretty much flavor it like whatever else you put in there is gonna it's gonna take on that flavor. And second question about the coffee. What are your thoughts on that? How does it affect your like your gut and how much can you drink it if you avoid that cup of tea? I was hoping to get that in my practice question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you noticed there was no coffee there. Yeah. I've been coffee free since January of this year. Uh, but it's it's based for me on my metabolism. So everybody has a unique ability to metabolize caffeine, and I'm a slow metabolizer. So coffee sticks around for too long, and it makes me jittery. So I found that I actually do better without it. So if you're someone who you feel like when you drink coffee that you get a little bit amped up, uh, you probably somewhere in the frame of a slow metabolizer, and that those caffeine metabolites stick around in your bloodstream for a long time. There's pros and cons to coffee. So coffee works as a promotility agent. Also depends on the type of coffee. Coffee tends to get contaminated with mold. Uh, so again, oh, promotility, sorry. That it uh, makes you go to the bathroom. <laughs> so in, if you're constipated, the morning coffee could be helpful for that. Uh, it also depends on what you combine. A lot of people don't drink black coffee. They put sugar in their coffee, they put cream, they put half and half. So it's all the things that get combined in there. If you buy your coffee on the go, you don't know what type of, even if you think you're getting it healthy by putting a nut milk, you don't know if they're using a sugar-free nut milk or it has seven grams of sugar per cup. So it all depends on how you combine it. Uh, but there's pros and cons to coffee. I can say now that I've been um, almost 11 months off of coffee that I have more energy without coffee than I did when I was drinking coffee. But I have tea instead. Yeah. Caffeinated tea? Or 
I do, but not every day. So I find like I'm I'm not caffeine dependent because I cannot have it. So some mornings I actually just have a green uh, green juice, like green juice uh, with lemon and uh, on my way to work, and I don't drink any caffeine. How about you, Maria? So I don't drink coffee either. Uh, I've actually never had coffee at all. I had this, when I was in the fourth grade, I had a teacher who drank coffee like it was going out of style, and her breath was so disgusting that it just ruined coffee for me for my entire life. Um, but I also don't, um, you know, I think there are better beverages. Uh, so another issue with coffee is that um, it, we're living in New York City, everyone's under a lot of stress and on the go all the time, and coffee can actually stress out your adrenal glands. And I think for people who are already stressed and sort of like, you know, just hyper vigilant all the time, it just kind of like adds on to that and it's not like a feeling most people like and a lot of people feel that jittery stuff. So um, I do prefer for a morning beverage, uh, tea, and that could be an herbal tea, it could be a green tea, a matcha tea is really great. And the interesting thing about green tea and matcha tea is that even though it does have caffeine, it's, it's less than coffee, Research shows it actually affects the body differently. So if you have the same amount of caffeine in a coffee versus, let's say, a matcha tea, the matcha tea is actually much gentler on your body, and so you're not going to have like that same sort of hyper like jitteriness that, that comes from coffee with the matcha tea. The coffee is like an accelerator, and green tea, the green tea leaf has something called L-theanine that acts as the counterbalance to the caffeine in it. And the, the highest caffeine is going to be in matcha because it's a ground tea leaf. So like a cup of coffee could be around 70 grams of caffeine, whereas the matcha will be around in the 50s. And a regular cup of tea would be somewhere in the 30s, 40s. Uh, but it's the other properties in it. And if you're thinking about like long-term health, uh, green tea is rich in polyphenols and has anti-cancer properties. It upregulates your, your liver's ability to detoxify. Uh, so there's plenty of reasons that even if you're a coffee drinker to mix it up with some green tea, thinking about long-term health and cancer prevention. Okay, I swear I did not plant these questions, but I have to say that Welby has a two-part coffee guide <laughs> last week and this week about how coffee impacts your health and, that, and also how everything that you put in it impacts your health, like Dr. Pedder is talking about the, the milks and the sugars and stuff. So check that out. Um, I think you've been waiting a long time. Yes. yes. I want to know what you think about the bulletproof coffee, which is good, coconut oil, concentrated, the grain of ten, and coffee. What do you think about that? So the, the question is, OK, we're still on coffee. <laughs> the question is, what do I think about bulletproof coffee? Look, it depends on the person. I have patients that live on Bulletproof and they love it. Uh, I'll say the great thing about it is that it keeps you in fat burning mo mode and the ghee is really high in butyric acid which is actually anti-inflammatory and healing for the gut. And the MCT oil is rich in beta hydroxy butyrates and other MCTs that your body uses for not just energy but also to fuel the brain. So it sharpens the brain. So it works well for some people. Um, but for, I find that a lot of people can't tolerate the amount of fat in like the way that it's traditionally made. Uh, and it can give you the runs. So you have to be careful. Like if you're, if you're gonna make a bulletproof coffee, like don't start with the recommended dose of ghee or grass-fed butter and MCT oil because you may get a really upset stomach and you'll find yourself running to the bathroom. Start low and then work your way up. I think we're gonna do maybe just one more question. Is that okay or do we have a lot more? Okay, we have two more. We'll do two more. So this is for Bashu. Um, thank you so much for your offering. It was really delicious. Um, I was really struck by your notion of intentional eating and your intentional relation to food. And I was wondering if you could speak more to that and speak more to how you cook and compare foods and sort of how you pair spices with, I noticed a lot of textures in that piece, so. Um, repeat the question. Uh, the question was about intentional eating and how, are you asking how I eat personally or how we sort of design the restaurant menu? Kind of like how you design the restaurant menu and like basically and sort of like how you pair um, 
vegetables and ingredients and spices and sauces. And, sure. Yeah. Um, so for me, uh, eating with intention was about sort of taking a, a holistic view on how we wanted to feel through our food. My, my sense was there was so much happening with the sort of awakening of people's consciousness about food and what they're putting in their body and I think the industrialization of the food you know the food system in this country really left people and people's bodies in a really sort of bizarre state um, and I think so much attention in the early part of this consciousness came from people really breaking down the supply chain and understanding where their food came from and so we had this fetishization of the farm and, and understanding who is growing your food. And I thought that that was the first part of what mattered, but I think what really matters is who we are as people, what we want to feel through our food, what our daily goals are, our weekly goals are, our life goals are, and how food can sort of play a supporting role in that. And so when we thought about our, our menu and our, our offering, um, it was, we thought, how can we source the best possible ingredients uh, how can we eliminate the things that people have varying degrees of, of irritations towards, whether it's dairy, gluten, uh, refined sugars, refined carbohydrates. Uh, and then we were guided by principles of Ayurveda that sort of said that, you know, a lot similar to, to what has been said already, eating with um, respect to different flavors, different colors. So all of our bowls are very bright. Uh, not because they look pretty and they're Instagram friendly, but also <laughs> we thought that that was, you know, it was a, a, a very literal interpretation of what vibrant eating was, but also, you know, the different colors had nutritional properties to them. Um, we also thought that food should be stimulating, not just nutritionally, but in terms of how it makes you feel in that moment. And so varying textures, I think, is just an important way to eat. And so we didn't want anything to be too homogenous. So we do try to think about crunch, uh, layering textures, layering flavors, layering different um, sort of activated feelings when you eat. Uh, and then the last piece of it was really thinking about seasonality, not just in terms of what's in the market and what's growing, but also what does your body need and what does your body crave uh, in the colder weather versus, versus the warmer weather. Uh, and then the last piece of it is it should be fun and enjoyable and, and, and delicious. Thank you. I think the last question tonight was there. Yes. Um, so it's two parts. The first one is, do you guys recommend colonics? Um, and the second one is, is there like a test that you can do to test out your, you know, your gut health? Where does it stand? Well, I'll just jump in quick and say, um, I think that's your colon's a one-way street, and uh, I don't think we really need colonics. I think that we can do a lot by what we're eating, um, and I, I would prefer to push it through that way than, than stick a hose up there. Uh, but that's just my personal, because the, the problem with, uh, with colonics, actually, though, is that you're putting water into your colon, and you do have this very diverse, uh, you know, hundreds and thousands of, of bacteria in there, and you're putting water in there, and you're, you are wiping some of them out. Uh, so, yeah, personally, I don't think it's the best way to, to go about it. But I'll let you, the expert. If you go to a colon hydrotherapist, make sure that at the very end they um, put in some probiotics. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, you can overdo it, and I've had patients that have overdone it, and it does wipe out your colon flora. And if they're not doing it the right way, if it's too high pressure, it can actually change your own body's uh, internal mechanisms for uh, colon contractions. Mm. So it's disrupting your own uh, body rhythm. So it has to be a low pressure if you ever do it. There are some benefits to it. Uh, so in terms of improving detoxification, and I've seen patients, for example, with uh, horrible skin with eczema actually improve by doing colonics. But I'm sure that if they just really went and cleaned out their diet, that they could probably achieve the same thing. Uh, in terms of testing this tool, there's a lot of different windows into the gut. And again, each of them is a different window and it's gonna give different information. Mm -hmm. So there's stool uh, PCR testing, there's stool cultures, 
There's companies like Genova, like uh, Great uh, Plains Lab, that do all sorts of different testing of this tool. And then there's a company like Ubiome uh, that you can actually go online and order a kit and do a swab of your stool and it's gonna come back with a profile on it. And that's kind of evolving. Um, so there's, there's different ways and there's a lot of different companies that are, are looking at this. There's another company called Biome uh, and I don't think that is available commercially just yet, uh, but that will be coming soon. Uh, so there, there, it's, there's no one right answer. And when you're looking at your stool, you really need to be working with a health practitioner that knows what they're doing because it's more than just like I was saying about Monet. It's not just looking at a piece of paper and knowing what's going on with each person. It's putting the entire picture together, the story combined with the information that you get through these different windows because each window is only giving you one view. So you have to then take that view and try to construct the picture of the whole person. But alcohol is sugar. So depending on what's going on in here yeah. and what the balances are, uh, wine could be feeding things like yeast in the gut. Uh, but the other, the flip side of wine is that it's rich in polyphenols. So grape polyphenols, I was just looking at a study uh, <clears throat> that uh, grape polyphenols actually feed and promote the growth of certain bacteria that help improve body mass composition and reduce the risk of diabetes. Mm -hmm and metabolic syndrome. Uh, and it was a study done on mice. So again, mice are not humans, but they're kind of a window into understanding human physiology, even though it's not, not exact. Uh, but we know there are benefits, but like anything in extreme, not so good. Right? Is that red and white? Is that for red and white? Red and white, but um, red is, is, has a higher content and it has resveratrol as well. I'm just gonna throw in though, if you're, if you wanna get nutrition, I would eat vegetables, I wouldn't look for it in my wine. Um, and it's not to say that you can never drink, um, but all alcohol is a liver toxin, right? So uh, it's probably not a good idea to do it often, um, but I think like one or two glasses, you know, every once in a while, one or two times a week, whatever, is totally fine. But uh, one thing I'll say is uh, sometimes people take that and like, oh, you can have one or two glasses of wine or you know, a drink you know, two or three times a week. Okay, so I'll just have six on Saturday night. I'll just save it. <laughs> but there's, there's no such thing as an alcohol bank. Uh, that's a really bad idea. It's much better to drink a little bit over you know, a course of time versus saving it all <laughs> for one evening. <laughs> And I think what Dr. Pedro said in the very beginning of the panel about your liver, your spleen, your bone marrow, and your gut are the four things that you know are going to help to bolster or weaken your immune system. So if you did feel something coming on, I would assume you would try not to yeah. drink at that. Yeah, alcohol, energy, and immunosuppressant. Yeah.